just delighted to be here this afternoon for several reasons. First, it gives me the opportunity to visit with my old friend Fred Carter, who taught me so much about how to get things done in politics. And I feel so honored that he invited me to come to speak at his university, which he loves so much. I'm also honored to be the first speaker in the Gender Studies program. Um, I hope you have many more, and I wish you all kinds of luck. And lastly, I'm in preparing this talk, I was forced to look over, I'm, gl I'm glad to be here, because I was forced to look over the voluminous materials I'd clipped and saved and stored away for future use and facts and theories which had disappeared from my mind, and now they're back on the front burner where they need to be. If I'm to be a mentor and a prod <clears throat> to those who can and should become more involved in the political scene. Whenever I talk about gender differences in politics, I preface my remarks with a qualifier. Whatever attributes and qualities I attribute to either men or women are generalities. They don't apply to all men or all women, only most men and most women. And of course, these generalities and that qualifier apply to other fields as well. Tonight, I plan to mention the thoughts of some serious thinkers about gender differences who have studied the issues scientifically as anthropologists or psychologists. But first, I'll tell you my own anecdotal experiences and observations after 18 years in politics. My personal story is about the progression from a shy, insecure housewife to politician swimming against the tide and yet somehow surviving and growing stronger thanks to the help of a lot of friends uh, made along the way, a very supportive family, and a lot of luck. While writing my book, I read memoirs and biographies of others in politics and found so many of the women expressed the same self-doubts and the same struggles and the same sense of fulfillment. The men's stories had an entirely different feel, so that's why I don't hesitate to generalize. I was born and bred in New York City, went to college in New York, uh, and after working a year, married a Navy doctor during World War II. We moved to Beaufort, his hometown, where I lived a very traditional life until I ran for office 30 years later. As a good doctor's wife, I did a lot of volunteer work and raised four children, and I stayed away from politics because my politics was so different from small-town conservative Beaufort. And I wanted to get along with everybody, and I wanted to help my husband build his practice. I did find friends who wanted more cultural activities, and together we worked to bring concerts and theater and dance to Beaufort. I wanted to give my children some of the advantages I had had growing up, and I also wanted to make Beaufort a better place to live. This turned out to be a good training ground for my future for political life. I learned organizational skills, and I learned how to find common ground and work with people who were very different from me in so many ways. This was my life for 30 years. Then at age 50, I was pulled into politics by my son, who returned to South Carolina after college to coordinate a presidential campaign. He asked me to help, and I said no. I didn't like his candidate. But I did agree to help register voters, and I discovered how many roadblocks there were, for <clears throat> there were in the system. So a friend and I organized the League of Women Voters to improve voter services. The League is the road to politics for many women, as is the Junior League, a service organization. Part of the League mission is to observe how government works. I volunteered to observe county council, about which I knew nothing. After observing some council men, mem meetings, I offhandedly sent to, said to a newspaper friend at dinner one evening, I'd vote differently than those men. They should be doing more about education, daycare, jobs. And he said, well, why don't you run? I was so flattered that he thought I was capable of doing such a thing, I agreed. My judgment was probably impaired by that glass of wine. And before I knew it, there it was in the newspaper. I was terrified, and I wanted to get out, but it was too late. To everyone's amazement, I was the top vote-getter among seven candidates for three seats. 
I won with the help of all those friends who worked with me in the arts and because my name was Kaiserling. He was the, the doctor Fred described so well. My husband had delivered most of the babies in Beaufort and his many patients really turned out for me. I also think that being a woman was an advantage because I, as the only woman, I stood out in that crowd of men. Also, I was perceived as a community worker who shared and cared about their everyday problems. Someone reachable, not a politician with a personal agenda. Today, I think it's even better for women, what with the public dismay with the political system and the perception that all politicians are crooks and self-serving. Women are perceived as independent, not beholden to special interests, more honest, hardworking, and not part of the good old boy system, where politics is used as a personal stepping stone to someplace else. And once the mold of men only has been broken, it's easier for other women to follow. Although I was the first woman to serve on Buford County Council, there has always been a woman since, even a chairwoman. I hadn't thought of myself as a woman candidate, but once elected, I discovered that everyone else did. Uh, the chairman of county council couldn't speak to Rotary when he was supposed to, and he asked me to fill in for him, and uh, he was to talk on the budget, and I said, sure. But w Rotary asked me instead to talk about what was it like to be the first woman on county council. The Hilton Head magazine asked me to do a book review. I used to write some articles for them about the arts, and the book they gave me was Elizabeth Jane Way's Man's World, Woman's Place. It was the first book on feminism I'd ever read. At first, I felt diminished to be relegated to this subject. After all, I was an economics major, and I could certainly talk about the budget. But I soon realized that the sorry place of women in today's society was an important subject, and nobody else was talking about it. From then on, when I graduated to other topics, I always managed to do, say something about women. During my second year on council, Buford's representative in the legislature decided not to run again, and a college student stopped me on the street one day and suggested I try. Again, I was flattered, and again, I hesitated, my insecurities bubbling up. Could I do it? Did I know enough? Was it fair to my husband to be away three days a week? My husband's answer was yes, that he'd been away many more nights delivering babies, and now it was my turn. So I ran and won, but just barely. The competition gets tougher when women try to move up the ladder. The Democratic leadership supported my opponent in the primary. Possibly they thought I couldn't win in the general election, or maybe they thought I'd be too independent. On my first day at the legislature, when I walked up that wide marble staircase of the State House to the enormous hall of the House chambers and watched the chattering, back-slapping mob of strangers, 114 men and nine women, I felt I was entering an exclusive men's club where everyone had someone, something in common, school, family, business, church, except me. I didn't know anyone, and they didn't know me. I was intimidated by them, and they seemed wary of me. All the men over 40 looked alike, and all the men under 40 looked alike, and I thought they all thought alike. But it turned out that our freshman class included a number of thoughtful, progressive members who were just as interested in reform as I was. Timing is everything in politics, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was very lucky in that one of the freshmen was a good friend of a close friend of mine, and he pulled me into a tight little group of talented people who later became known as the Crazy Caucus. We were the natural opponents of the Fat and Uglies, a self-named group of uh, good old boys who were trying to protect the status quo at all costs. 